You all get that, right? He says, I've got it covered. Jeff was going to sing anyway. <laughs> God does great work when we let him. All right, well, it's time to go back to the wilderness. I know, some of you are tired of the wilderness. Well, you know what? Sometimes the wilderness is just a part of life. You know, I keep reminding you, those Israelites, when they escaped from Egypt and they were making that 40-day trip to the Promised Land, they were in the wilderness 40 years. So if we have to spend four weeks in the wilderness, we can handle it, I think. Turn to somebody and say, can we? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you, sir. All right. So what is the wilderness? The wilderness is that scary place. We don't want to be there. And we don't want to be there. That wilderness is a lonely place. It can be a frightening place. But it is also oftentimes the place where we hear God's voice more clearly than any other time in our lives. The wilderness is that place where the beasts are wild, and we've talked about some of those beasts, the beast we call fear and temptation and despair and hunger and thirst. The wilderness is that place where if we are to survive, we must focus on the will of God, which is found in the word of God that shows us the way of God. Now in Sunday school, we spent a little bit of time with that triumvirate, um, that three-piece category, and I think there's going to be a sermon about that later on down the road once we get out of the wilderness. But we need to focus there. The wilderness is that place where habitual dependence on God sees us through to the promised land and to the resurrection and to even more. The wilderness is that place where we see Jesus as the good shepherd or as the vine of life or perhaps even as the great high priest. And in those images we find our priorities, our very lives will be lining up for resurrection. But listen for it. You can hear it. You can hear the hands that most of you are sitting on because you're afraid that you want to raise your hand at this point. There's a word that's leaping to your minds, and trust me, from here I can hear it. It's a very short word, only three letters long. It's not sin. That was the guess at the first service. But that's not the word that preachers hear all the time. There's a three-letter word that um, begins sentences and you know what's coming next. Because you know that as soon as this word is uttered, there's an excuse or a doubt about to be shared. That word, of course, is the three-letter word, but... Any of you ever say the word, but? Any of you ever say the phrase, but I? Fill in the blanks. I won't ask you to come confess at this point. Any of you ever start a sentence out this way, but what about? Now, I'm telling you, over the last course of the last month, every hand in this building ought to be raised, I think, maybe twice. Let me just suggest that when we started talking about having one of the world's top Christian bands come and do a concert at First Christian Church in Duncanville, some of those hands went up and said, but, and it sounded like this, but not rock music, but not in the fellowship hall, but not $3,000, but 
Joe, were there any other butts in there? I'm sure there were. Some of you own up and say that you had some butts to think about that, comp that idea. Because my friends, I know how people are. And I've looked, you're all people. Now, behind me in the choir, Your people too? You see, one of the things I know is that in matters of great faith, in matters of church and religion, sometimes that word, but, gets in the way. You know, there are people laughing at me in this congregation this morning. <laughs> I think they're on my side at this point. I just know who they are. You see, when we use that word but, oftentimes we're expressing our doubt that something could really happen. That something good might be found outside of our box of comfort. Any of you have a box of comfort? You might call it, call it your comfort zone. And, and as long as everything happens to you, happens to you in that comfort zone, everything's fine, right? Say amen. amen. But as soon as I ask you to step out of that box more than about three and a half inches, we get a little nervous. Like the pew you sit in. Like what? Like the pew they sit in. Like the pew you sit in. Ah. <laughs> uh, You know, I had a great time last night. I went and saw the movie Noah. Now, I know it's been in the news. The conservative Christian world has been eating it alive because it doesn't go exactly by the Bible. It has to be two hours long. <laughs> Give us a break, right? It's a great movie. I'm, I'm endorsing the movie, by the way, but don't go think that you're going to go see it and all of a sudden understand the story perfectly. Because they do take some license. They do some things to make it a little more entertaining. They do some things to make it worthy of two hours of film. And in that process, they did leave some things out, and they added things that aren't there. And obviously, behind me at the movie theater yet last night, there was somebody who obviously knew the story far better than me. <laughs> because he was explaining to his date or his wife, you know, maybe both, Where he had, where the writers had messed up. And three times I found myself <laughs> really. I really wanted to say something. And you know how shy I am. But I was with friends, so I didn't. Actually, I didn't. Not even after the movie. I was good. But oh, I wanted to turn around. It's a great movie about the doubts that come with faith. You know, that story really is a powerful story about doubt. posed the question, why me? Why him? Why is this happening? Why? You know, that's a heck of a job for somebody over 600 years old. Amen. To build a boat in the middle of the desert. How many boat builders do you think were around? <laughs> One. One, his name's Noah. 
Do you know why it didn't have a, a, a bow and a stern? Because they didn't know about that. It was a box <laughs> the size of a football field. Only bigger, actually. I love the fact that somebody actually took the biblical account of the ark and built one. It's in a pond in Denmark or Sweden or someplace. Somebody says, is it seaworthy? And the guy says, are you kidding? I built it. <laughs> I think that's probably true. You see, in the wilderness time, just about every part of our lives has some test in it. Everything we believe at one point or another is called into question. We call that doubt. Doubt is often a part of our wilderness experience. It's just a part of life. If you're alive, you've had doubt. It's that simple. Our cry in the wilderness is oftentimes the cry of the young man or the father in, in the scripture reading where it says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The cry of this father seeking healing for his son was not the first such cry in life and it won't be the last. People of faith down through the ages, including the greatest Christian leaders of all time, have experienced doubt in the wilderness of their lives. Unfortunately, we in the church have often dismissed or discounted doubts as a product of Satan or of evil. Or we've decided that the person who doubts is exhibiting an immature faith. But I'm going to suggest that on any given Sunday sitting right here in the sanctuary at First Christian Church or any other church are many people who hold unresolved issues of faith and belief, but do so believing with their whole heart in Jesus Christ. The important truth is that doubt is a part of our faith journey. We can't escape it. If that's true, and I believe it is, there are a couple of things we need to understand about it. The first is this. Doubt is part of the Christian's journey. It is not the destination. It is not the stopping point. Doubt is not where we go and hang out forever. Doubt is where we go to find answers to our questions. Doubt is what brings us face to face with the issues of faith and help us develop a resounding response of belief. When when, when doubt it becomes a stopping point, really bad things happen. When, we, when, when doubt is where we stop, we find despair, hopelessness. When doubt's just a place on the map that we visit on the journey, we move on to faith and hope and joy and love. You see... Doubt, if it's just a part of the journey, always moves us forward. That's something that's really important. If our questions move us forward, we know that the doubt is being answered. If we find ourselves taking up residence there, it's time to move on. You see, there's an immense difference between wrestling with our doubts and growing our faith than simply living in our place of doubt. 
Now, the key to doubt being a journey and a part of the journey and not a destination, of course, is actually caring about God. It's when we move on to faith that the journey continues. Because the second thing about faith or, or doubt that I would tell you is that doubt is always a stimuli to faith. The good news is all of us experience doubt, right? You've all had doubt. Hopefully that doubt has moved us to grow in our faith. I was listening to the joys and concerns today. Were you all listening? Were you listening to the, the people stepping up and how I heard prayer after prayer, either joy or concern, offered that I've been hearing coming from prayer encounter groups? One of the doubts that was expressed to me is that the, the, the prayer encounter groups wouldn't work. But if you're in a prayer encounter group, anybody want to say it's not working for you? No. In these groups, we are finding people that we've known for maybe a long time or maybe just for a week or two. And by golly, it's nice to be prayed for by them. And it's nice to pray for them. And, and you're, we're getting to know each other at a deeper, more personal level. We're seeing the needs, the hurts, the desires of God's people in this place. And as the prayers were being offered today, I heard five things said that had its beginning in our prayer encounter groups. To me, that's powerful. That's changing the culture of First Christian Church. You see, the doubt we experience in the wilderness times can be and is beneficial to us. Frederick Buchner wrote, he says, if you don't have any doubts, because I've had people come up and say, I don't doubt ever. I wish I'd known this quote because this is what I would have said. If you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or you're asleep. <laughs> For doubts, now this is the best part. It's hard to imagine a theologian actually writing this, but I kind of like it. Doubts <coughs> are the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> and you know how that works, right? I have to tell you that God's most faithful servants, you can make a list of them, Moses and Noah and Esther and Ruth, Isaiah and David and Micah and you know, even Jesus experienced times of great doubt and anguish. Crying out to God, Lord, it can't be. Not this way, Lord. Even Jesus, before his crucifixion, in the Garden of Gethsemane, cried out at the top of his lungs, not my will, but yours, but Lord, if this could be, this burden could be lifted off of me. Take it. Hanging on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? power of doubt because he was focused he could see where he was going he knew what the goal was he never stopped believing even though in his hearts of hearts he would have been he would have rather been anywhere else it's too easy sometimes it's too easy to think of doubt as the opposite of faith, but it's really not. The opposite of doubt, I think, is apathy or absolute disbelief. How many of us at one time or another have stood by apathetically when our faith has come under scrutiny or under fire by the people in the press or the people in our city or the people sitting next to us in church.
So what do we do with our doubt? What do we do when we start to have questions that bring doubt into play? Well, the first thing I would tell you to do is don't dismiss it. Pay attention to it. We need to not suppress our doubt. We need to ask the questions of doubt. Because I think real faith begins with intellectual honesty. And doubt is the foundation of honesty. Ask the questions. Keep searching. Don't let your doubt stop up your channel to God. Let doubts open the channel. Let your doubts be the starting place for discussion between you and God and and you and other Christians. Pray to God, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. The second thing we can do, I sort of mentioned it just a minute ago, but the second thing in our doubts is stay connected to other believing Christians. I know that seems really simple when I'm standing here in church, but, but when I have questions that bring doubt on Tuesday, what do we do? Do we call our Christian friends and talk with them about it, or do we just turn on NCIS and hope that you can find an answer there? <laughs> I love NCIS. They have all my answers. I don't even know if it's on Tuesday night. It is? <laughs> There's somebody who knows. <laughs> I love the story of Thomas, the disciple. He's famous, isn't he? We have a name for him. Doubting, Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas! We ridicule him for having questions. Well, we don't really ridicule him because we have the same questions. And we never remember that it was Thomas who just a few chapters earlier, when Jesus was getting ready to go to his crucifixion and said, I must go to Jerusalem, and all the 11 other disciples said, No, Jesus, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Thomas gets to the end of the line and says, Yes, Lord, let's go, and let's go with him. We don't remember that, do we? We only remember the fact that he had a question. We only remember the fact that he had some doubts that honestly every single one of us in this room would have expressed as well. In the church, we have support. In the church, we can find answers and and help in ending our doubts. And then the third thing we we need to do when it comes to doubt, we need to continue to keep our focus first and foremost on Jesus. For it's as we build that relationship with Jesus, our doubt is dissipated. As we build that relationship with Jesus, we find answers. Goes back, Jeremiah put it this way, he says, Speaking for God says, when you search for me, you will find me. Jesus put it this way. He said, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. You see, when we are honest in that relationship with Jesus, our doubts are going to find answers. Our questions are going to lead us to faith. The final piece of scripture I want to call your attention to is that scripture reading from John that we read. It's the story of the man born blind. Jesus is walking by. Jesus finds him. The man's blind from birth. He's never seen anything. He's never seen a sunrise. He's never seen his parents. His world's been dark. And the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus found him. And he t- 
talked with him. And he spit and made some mud, and he put it on his eyes, and he told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And I find it really interesting that the blind man went and did what Jesus said. He went to the pool of Siloam, and he washed, and he was able to see. I guarantee you that the man born blind never expected his healing to cause such great, great upheaval. The Pharisees got involved. They knew this guy. Who healed you? Oh, it was Jesus. Jesus healed me. You know that guy over there? He says, the, the Pharisees tried to cast doubt on Jesus, said, he can do it. He's not good. And the blind man says, or the man who was born blind says, I don't know if he's good or bad, but he, he healed me. And then they tried to cast doubt for his parents. And his parents said, go ask him. And the blind man meets Jesus later and says, I've never seen such a thing. Jesus says, well, do you believe in the Son of Man? And, and he says, show him to me. And Jesus said, the one who healed you, the one who's talking to you now is he. And the blind man, without missing a beat, said, Lord, I believe. In the face of all the doubt, the blind man believed. In the face of all the doubt, the father of the little boy believed. In the face of your doubt, do you believe? Our hymn of invitation.